After a lifetime of researching the dynamic and enigmatic world of light entertainment, I've decided to ditch my notebook and meet the people who inspire me. What makes them the people they are? How do they feel about the show business landscape in which they find themselves? And in a world where anyone can be a star, is there still a need for performers who have universal appeal? Come with me on a journey of discovery as I get a unique insight into Britain's favourite stars with a little help from my glamorous assistants. Yeah, well, I say glamorous, more like hazardous. And of course, we'll have a bit of fun along the way. If you have been a lover of British drama over the last 30 years, you almost certainly would have laughed, cried or been inspired by Tony Jordan's vast repertoire of gripping moments on television. Because for over a quarter of a century, Tony Jordan has remained one of Britain's leading scriptwriters, joining the BBC's heavyweight serial drama EastEnders in 1989 before going on to write some of the show's defining moments. A former East End market trader himself, Jordan used his experience of this world to create and dominate Soapland for over two decades before exchanging Albert Square for the renowned, unpredictable world of a production company. Red Planet Pictures has been responsible for some of the best British drama of the last 20 years, including Life on Mars, Death in Paradise, and the episodic period drama Dickensian. I was interested to learn about his early years in television, how they informed his later ventures, and after 30 years in the business, why does he remain so enchanted by the art of storytelling? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tony Jordan. Mr. Tony Jordan, you're listed in the broadcast magazine as the number one screenwriter in the UK. What do you make of that? The first lesson I learnt on my scriptwriting degree was that the writer, to some extent, is invisible. But over the years, you've developed a consider considerable amount of fame yourself. How does that feel, and do you think fame slightly takes away from a writer's purpose? Um, I think it's all a bit of stuff and nonsense in, in the first thing. I don't know how, I don't know what the... I think if you're running a race and you come first, that's quite clear that you're quite first. But I think in the arts, I don't know how you can be a number one or a number two or a number three. How does that work? How do you? How, do you, how does that work? Um, you can't be... They don't do the same with musicians. You, you can do it by record sales or you can do it by something else, but, but not by by what you do. And as a writer, it's impossible to to quantify. So I don't take too much notice about things like uh, being listed as number one screenwriter in the UK because um, if I recall, uh, they do those things every year and it changes every year. So I never I never take too much notice of it. As for my persona being out there as a writer and not being invisible, that helps these days. It helps because executives like to have a safe pair of hands for their shows. So, because the way it works, if you're a television executive and you hire um, Jimmy McGovern and the show doesn't work, then you can say to your bosses, well, what's not my fault? Who, how could I know? It was a Jimmy McGovern show. It, it, I, I don't know why it didn't work, but it was nothing to do with me. Whereas if he hires an, an unknown writer and it doesn't work, he'll probably get sacked because it was, that was down to him. So I, I understand that I represent a safe pair of hands. So if people know who I am as a writer, that helps me sometimes because I can go here and in the US and they've heard of me, they knew, know who I am, they take my pitch seriously and they think that I can deliver what I'm saying to them. So it's kind of, I don't take too much notice of it, but it helps sometimes. So in 1989, you became a resident writer on the infamous EastEnders. As a former market trader yourself, how did this enhance your, your ability to identify with the life of the characters in Albert Square? Yeah, a lot, I think. I think the, the one thing... I, see, I didn't start writing until I was 33. So I was quite... I'd had a life before I started. It always am, amuses me now when I have new writers come in to see me. And, you know, they're kind of straight out of uni and they've just done a, a media course and, they, you know, they're kind of 22. And I think, what are you going to write about? God, you, you haven't had a life. So by the time I was 33, I'd kind of been married, divorced, had kids. I was kind of, you know, bought a house. I was trying to make a living as a market trader. Um, I'd had uh, no money. I'd, just, I'd been through all those things. So I always felt that I had something to write about by the time I came to EastEnders. And the other thing was that I always, uh, what that meant was that I, I didn't do the university route. I didn't do any of those things. I left school when I was 14. 
and I went straight to work. So, and the markets uh, are a place where real people reside. The markets, the people who watch EastEnders, uh, reside in markets. That's where that's their natural habitat. So I knew the audience. I may not have known anything about drama, and I may not have known anything about um, a, a narrative structure then when I started because I was still quite naive. But I did know the audience. I knew what made them laugh. I knew what they found. I knew what they thought was important. I knew that um, I knew the things that, that they worried about, um, and so it really helped me. I think, and I think that's why I hit the ground running at EastEnders, not because I was a, a particularly good or experienced writer at that time, but because I understood the audience. Keeping with EastEnders. You wrote almost 200 episodes. How did you constantly keep things fresh whilst maintaining the same style and tone set by Julia Smith and Tony Holland? Um, I think if you understand what EastEnders is, and I think that if you, if you understand that it's about clans, and I think that that's the most important thing about EastEnders, and people miss it sometimes. I think what Julia and Tony created was a, was a show about clans. There were the, there were the Fowlers and the, the Watts and... And so when I, you know, so when I was working on the show, I, I was always aware of that. So we created the Slaters and the Mitchells, and we tried to keep those that clan thing going because there's nothing quite as exciting as feuds between clans, and because then within that within that structure, you can then do Romeo and Juliet, you can do all those other stories that kind of feed in and out of it, but with those with those established clans clans. Um, and I think when East, EastEnders is, is at its best, that's how it works. And when it's at its worst, they just bring in odd characters on their own that aren't really attached to anything. And they come and they murder someone or they steal a baby or they, you know, they turn someone over and it's not, there's no, re, there's nothing real about them. Um, and I think that that's when it, uh, when it doesn't work. So to me, the secret about keeping it fresh was being, uh, being aware of what the show was about and it was about family and clans and also being aware about um, about of being aware of sorry of the audience and understanding what they were talking about because if you can talk about the same things then they will they'll recognize that and you'll have their empathy and it's actually not about being fresh necessarily I think I've told the same gag about a hundred times on these days my thing was always battle of the sexes so in every episode, I would put all the, uh, not every episode, but I did it a lot, where you put all the blokes at one end of the pub and all the women at the other end of the pub. And it, 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 the blokes end, they'd be saying, the trouble with women is, and they'd do this whole thing. And then we'd cut to the women going, the trouble with men is, because that's a real thing. Women talk about their husbands to each other. They talk about, he did this and he did that, and I'm not having this, and I'm not putting up with that. And men do that when they're in the pub. Bloody woman, she's done this. So I'm, that's real. So it's not about being fresh and reinventing the show every episode. It's about being uh, being real and, and, and writing things that people recognise. And I think that's where the longevity comes from. You had a hand creating arguably two of the most identical characters in television history. Of course, I'm talking about Phil and Grant Mitchell. Did you always know that they would become such icons of soap? Uh, no, no, because you never know. You, you never know. You, you try and... Um, I, I, st I also had a hand in the creation of the Ferreira family in EastEnders, which were the Asian family that no, probably no one remembers. So there's a kind of an alchemy to it. There's an alchemy to, to creating characters. And um, these, I think the difference for me is that I knew people like Phil and Grant Mitchell. Because if you think of my background and where I come from, I think of the markets... And the world that I lived in, I knew people like Phil and Grant. And I remember that, um, you know, people say, well, would they have tattoos? And would they, it's like, no, that's the, that's, the, that's the Daily Mail version of those characters. In reality, they're not like that. They're good, strong, you know, they're, they're family people. They work hard. All right, they're tough and don't, you don't want to cross them. But, but to all intents and purposes, they're just like you and me. And so it was easy for me to write Phil and Grant because... Um, because I knew them as I knew the real versions of them in the real world. So again, the same thing, and that's a that's a theme that runs through everything that I've done. If you understand the world, if you understand the characters that you're writing about, it leaps off the page. 
And when you're kind of not so sure and you're kind of you're out of your depth a little bit, I think that shows too. So um, EastEnders was a gift for me because it was it was for a world I recognised. El Dorado, Albion Market, and Castles are all examples examples of when BBC serial drama hasn't struck a chord with the public. Bearing these in mind, what do you think is the secret of EastEnders' success? I think EastEnders' success is is based on uh, creative integrity. So when Tony Holland created the show, it was predominantly, as I understand it, I wasn't around at the time, but from what I can gather, and I met Tony and spent a lot of time with Tony Holland later um, because we worked on El Dorado together. Um, but it was predominantly about his family, or a lot of the characters were about his family. And he used to tell me, you know, Pauline Fowler is this auntie and this person was his uncle and this was his dad, or based on those people. And so I had a real, so again, the same thing, the same thing comes through. It was a reality to it. It was real. It was it was about real people, um, and I think that that's uh, that's what stood it in good stead. And I think when uh, the same can be said of Coronation Street, when Coronation Street started, they were real people. You know, everything's got a little bit more height than these days, but 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 when Coronation Street started, that was about real people. It was about people mending their bikes in the front room, and you know, it, um, and I often quote the the the. the um, the thing that when Ken Barlow was a young man came home from university, he the story of that episode was that he was embarrassed by his working class parents and the fact that he had the KP sauce bottle on the table because he was now aspirational and and thinking he was living in you know in a in a better place. So though the, the minutiae of, of those worlds are a key, and if you have that great creative integrity and it's the shows that actually about something then I think that it, it, it will work. El Dorado was a different experience. When Tony Holland first created El Dorado, it was called Little England. And it was about a, a, a small English community, almost like a siege mentality, surrounded by Germans and Dutch and French and everyone else. And that small um, siege mentality Brits abroad was really rich and it felt real, it felt, it felt real. And then what happened is, as the sh when the show was in development and we were developing stories and things, the producers then started to see that El Dorado, if we played our, if they played their cards right, could become the world's not the world's first, but Europe's first soap. So a soap that would play in every uh, in every region of Europe. So it would be the first truly European show. So they kept going back to Tony and saying. Oh, the German character. Could we have another German character? And could it be in? Could there be more of him? And then, because then we'll get a deal with the Germans. And then, could we have a French couple? Because then we'll get a deal with the French. And could we have a? So it suddenly became like a Euro soup pudding thing, and lost. I think lost all the integrity of, of the original show, which was Little England. And because of that, it failed because it was built on sand, um, and so therefore it failed. I think with Albion Market. Um, and actually, what's funny about Albion Market, probably nobody knows, is that obviously I didn't write on it. It was before it was before I became a writer. But as a market trader, I was invited to go up to Albion Market to talk to the cast about being a market trader. How weird is that? Not knowing that ten years later I'll actually be a writer. Um, and Albion Market, I think, was the same thing. I think a couple of people sat in a in a Granada um, exec's office and said. Where do normal people go? Where, do, where, where can we do a soap? Uh, what, what about the markets? They're all quite earthy and kind of work, people are there, aren't they? Let's do it in the market. So there was no, again, it was cynical. You can smell the cynicism in some things. And I think that the difference between EastEnders, El Dorado and Albion Market, that's the difference. EastEnders had an integrity to it and I don't think the other two did. Uh, Christmas is coming, which only means one thing in Soapland, the dramatic Christmas special. How much imagination are you allowed to use when creating these explosive episodes? Um, <clears throat> the way it worked on EastEnders was that um, we had like a, a, a tier system. So the, lead, the, the main writers would go away um, three or four times a year to, to long-term story conference. So we'd go and stay in a hotel for three or four days and we'd work out big stories like what if this happened? What if Phil Mitchell was a Martian? What if he got shot? What if she slept with him? What if, you know, what if, what if? Um, and we do like big stories and 
usually lead and a lot of that was leading up to the big September autumn launch. The summer's over, it's getting darker, what's the big story for the autumn? And then another was what's the big story for Christmas? And then you come back into back to L Street with those big stories. They then go to the story team who would break them down into episodes. So they take little bits of that story and just kind of block them into episodes. Um, and they do that with all the stories. So as a writer, what you usually got was two or three pages of A4, which told you roughly what had to happen in your episode. Um, but really, the, the, the reality was that as long as you, as long as you, you um, everybody was the same way you, so as long as you picked up all the characters where the, other, the person before you had left them, so you pick up in the same place. And as long as you put them, leave them where they're supposed to be left in, uh, for the other one to pick up, you can do pretty much anything you want. So, so in other words, if in that storyline someone died, um, if it mattered that they were either run over or fell off a roof, then obviously you had to do whatever was in the story document. But if it didn't matter, if, there was, if it wasn't about who was driving the car, it wasn't about anything else, I could choose how they would die, possibly. Um, so how you got you had to get from A to B, but how you chose to do that was you got a lot of freedom um, about how you how you got how you structured your own episode as long as you stayed within the parameters. Christmas was slightly different because it was such a big deal that you'd make a pitch for what you wanted to do at Christmas, and you could move some of your story stuff backwards or push it forwards to give you a bit more space to do what you wanted. Um, my thing was I didn't like Christmas being miserable. So I think in all my Christmas episodes it snowed. Uh, I seem to remember uh, episodes like Alfie picking Cat up in his arms, walking through the snow to his Fort Capri waiting. Um, or uh, Turkey escapes from the Slaters. I tried to just, it's Christmas Day, you don't want too much misery. So um, yeah, my mum was a bit lighter than, than most of the others, I think. From researching the background of your career, two people who made a definite impact on you were John Sullivan and Carla Lane. Did you ever consider emulating these great figures and trying to write a sitcom? Um, yeah, well, I kind of... Um, John Sullivan and Carla Lane were, were quite interesting because when I first... Uh, when I wrote my first script and sent it off to the BBC, they... Uh, before I got any writing jobs, they kept inviting me to to like seminar things where they bring experienced writers to talk to new writers. And Carla Lane and, uh, and John Sullivan were two of the people that I, that I went to listen to. Um, Carla Lane was interesting because I was born in Merseyside and she was a, obviously a, a scouse. Um, she did bread and did all those things which I grew up watching, so I was a big fan. John Sullivan, I think, was the person that made me think, hang on a minute, maybe I can be a writer. Because I used to go to these seminars and I didn't really understand what people are talking about. I'd never been, a, I'd never wanted to be a writer. I'd just written a script and it just kind of, people read it and liked it. So I, I sort of fell into it. So I wasn't sure I wanted to be a writer. And I certainly didn't know what people, they're friends of reference. You know, I didn't know about Shakespeare or Dickens or anybody really. Um, so I always felt a little bit out of my depth until the day I watched, I, I went to a seminar for John Sullivan. And he came in with his shirt hanging out, and his arse hanging out of his jeans, and sat down, and he was just a bloke. And it was like, oh, right, okay, so like normal people can do this too. You don't have to be a, you don't need a, a, a floppy hat and a cape and a cane. You can, people like me can write. So that was really important. Um, I, have, I, did a, I did a sitcom called Moving Wallpaper about behind the scenes of a soap. So I have done some comedy. Um, what's really sad is, um, about a year before he died, BBC Comedy called me and said, we'd love you to do something with John Sullivan. And uh, and so we want to take you both for dinner. So the people from BBC Comedy took me and John Sullivan. That's the first time, obviously I'd seen him at the seminar, but now 20 years later, I was now going out for dinner with him. And what was amazing was, obviously I knew him and virtually every line of Only Fools and Horses and, and Six and Smith and all that stuff. Uh, all that brilliant body of work, but he knew my stuff. He knew about hustle. He knew, so he was a fan of mine as well. So we got on really well. We talked about doing something together, and then it just never happened. And he died kind of a year later. 
So that's a real um, that's a, a real sadness for me because um, I'd love to have written something with it. The 1980s saw a creative boom of pioneering television writers and directors like Antonia Bird, Phil Redmond, Alan Bleasdale, and of course yourself. Thinking retrospectively, how did these people help to define TV drama at this time? Well, I don't. I, um, it's very nice of you to put me in that company. I don't think I was in that company. I'm, I'm certainly not in the company of people like Alan Bleasdale. I think they were just brave. You know, it was a it was a period of television before. Too much uh, store was placed on the on the commerciality of things, and it was a time when um, when it was about brave stories and brave writers uh, were allowed the freedom to write those kinds of stories. And it's not that it doesn't happen now; of course it does, but I just don't think as frequently. I think now, uh, look at the movies. Like every film now is about Marvel superheroes, you know. The industry is more about the business sometimes than it is about the story. <clears throat> and I think that um, sometimes something will, will cut through. You'll get a show like Breaking Bad or you get something that will really slice through and it becomes, you know, something quite extraordinary. Um, but that seemed to happen more often in the 80s <clears throat> with, uh, with those playwrights, you know, with, with Aitborn and with, um, with Willie Russell, with Bennett, you know, with those things. They were really strong... They also had a theatre background as well, so that the discipline of telling those stories in that in that um, in that way, uh, I don't know. I think they're still around. I think we still we still do that. Um, Phil Redmond was a different proposition. I think um, he was more of the ilk of Tony Holland and you know those kind of series creators. But um, yeah, those those huge play, playwrights I grew up uh, watching and in awe of, and probably without knowing they may be the reason why I ended up being a writer, I guess. To what extent do the fixed confines of television hinder a writer's creativity? Oh, gosh, uh, always, I guess, is the answer. You, there's, um, the, uh, actually, what's really funny is, is, the, is the, the, the leap that I've made. I remember when I was, just purely as a writer, I'd kind of write, uh, you know, I'd be at my typewriter and it'd be like, um, you know, 50 helicopters come over the horizon, followed by 3,000 tanks. And I'd always be in conversations with uh, producers who'd say, oh, the, the whole helicopter and tank thing, could it be like six helicopters and two tanks? And it was always about budget and I always used to resent that. Um, and what's really strange is now that I, uh, since I started Red Planet Pictures, so now I make the shows that I write, and, um, uh, and so I'm now poacher to gamekeeper. As I'm writing, I'm, I'm starting to write. Four hundred horses, two hundred. A horse comes over the horizon, so I kind of do it. So look, those confines are always there because uh, there's only so much money. You have a, you know, you, there's only so much money, and um, and now with the, with the world of special effects, with the world of you know how much talent and good actors cost you. Is uh, you have a really, really rigid parameters, um, but I kind of like that sometimes. I used to like um, with EastEnders some of my favourite episodes to write. I remember were the two handers where you just have two characters. I went back to write uh, Doc Cotton's one hander where it was only her for the entire episode, and that somehow that makes you work harder as a writer. Sometimes it's easy to chuck special effects in and. And things and so sometimes those parameters are on the surface appear to be to limit you and to limit your creativity and your and your ability to to, to have a narrative that that, that that works over that space of time sometimes it makes you work harder and sometimes that's a good thing some years ago you created red planet pictures and have enjoyed varied success with a plethora of successful tv dramas death in paradise dickensian Hustle, is it easier getting original TV ideas commissioned when you're a production company rather than a recognised solo writer? Uh, <clears throat> no, not really. I think the thing is, is that you, uh, what I needed, when I was just a solo, when I was just a writer for hire, I needed to partner up with a production company in order to go to a broadcaster. Because obviously as a writer, I can write the scripts, but I can't make the show. So I had to partner up with with a production company that could make the show. So we went to a broadcaster 
It's a complete package. We can write it, we can, we can make it. Um, and so for shows like Life on Mars and, uh, and uh, Hustle and Moving Wallpaper, I partnered up with, with um, a production company called Kudos. And so we would go to the broadcaster together and it would be uh, Tony's writing the scripts and we're gonna make the show. And that was a partnership that, that, um, that I enjoyed for, for, lot, for a lot of years. Um, it then just became clear to me that sooner or later it would be a good idea for me to do the whole thing so that I could not only write the scripts but then I could make the show. And to do that I had to start my own production company. So I started Red Planet Pictures um, and now we make not only my shows but we make uh, other, like uh, Death in Paradise you mentioned is, is um, a Robert Thorogood's show. So we make shows for other writers too. So it's not just to make my stuff, it's to, it, we're a production company that makes um, all kinds of productions. And I like that. You get a level of control of uh, that you don't get as a solo writer. I get to be a showrunner, so I get to do the casting and the locations and hire the director and hire the line producers and you know you get to do everything. So it's much easier to get the vision that's in your head when you put it on paper. It's much easier to to bring that vision to life if you're in control of of every aspect. On the subject of Death in Paradise, were you ever tempted to take on some of the writing responsibilities yourself? And uh, why do you think it's been so successful? Um, <clears throat> I've never, uh, no, not been tempted to, to take on any of the writing responsibilities because that's not what Red Planet is all about. Red Planet is not about me as a writer necessarily. I'm Red Planet's um, probably most recognised writer, but that's all I am. We have other writers. Um, it's not the kind of company where I over, where I rewrite everything or or I you know insist on redoing all the scripts. Uh, God, I'd, I'd die. That would be. I can't do everything. Um, so in, within Red Planet, I write my own shows. The good thing is, if you're a writer that comes to write for Red Planet, I'm here to talk through your stories, to talk through your the way that you write, the, through serial elements, through series. Um, I'm here to help because that's what uh, that's what Red Planet's all about. But certainly not to to do to do all the writing. Um, and as for why it's been so successful, I think um, it's a lot of different things. But there's a uh, there's a drama trope of kind of fish out of water that really works. However, you do that, but fish out of water really works. And then there's something about being a fish out of water in the Caribbean and uh, and airing that in January. So I think everybody's freezing and cold, and it's winter outside. And for, for 60 minutes on a Tuesday night, they get to go to the Caribbean and, uh, and they're entertained. And I think that's why it's, uh, I think that's why it's a hit. It's a, when television is at its best, I think television is escapism. And again, going right back to what we talked about earlier about, about understanding your audience. I understand what it's like to work hard all day. And I understand that. And when I get in, I have something to eat. I don't necessarily want to be fucking miserable. I don't necessarily want to sit and watch a serial killer killing babies and it takes me 27 weeks to find out who did it. I'm not sure I want to watch that. I want to grab a beer, put my feet up and be entertained. And I think sometimes television at its best, that's what it does. And I think Death in Paradise is one of those shows. Um going on to another one of the shows Dickensian has followed in the footsteps of other recent period dramas such as Bleak House uh, by producing episodes which run into double figures and are 30 minutes in length how effective do you think this formula is on maintaining an audience's interest um, Dickensian is a weird one really um, look the format works 30 minutes um, for drama works because all if you look at the top shows in the ratings every week they're all 30 minute dramas. EastEnders, Correlation Street, and you know, the soaps are all 30 minutes. So the format clearly works. The problem is it's quite a crowded space. That pre-watershed 30 minute, um, and that's one of the problems we have with Dickensian, because uh, that's where we wanted to be, because that was the kind of, um, that's where we wanted to be, um, but it's a really crowded space because you're fighting all the other 30 minute dramas. So it was really difficult. So the answer is yes. I think it's a great way of, of hooking an audience in, giving them small bite-sized pieces of, of drama. 
and hooking them in to watch the next one. I think it really works. Um, I'm really proud of Dickensian. I think of of all the things I've done, it's probably the thing I'm most proud of um, because I think that the central idea of taking all Dickens characters and putting them all in the same place is a really cool thing. Um, nobody's ever done that before. Not even Dickens himself wrote the scene between Fagin and Scrooge. So that's pretty cool. Um, the way that we shot it, we built that set, I think it was an amazing show. And we, um, we actually got to the point where it doubled the uh, footfall through the Dickens Museum in London. Um, we had hundreds of, uh, of uh, emails and letters from schools and colleges saying that people were going back to the books because they were seeing something on, um, uh, they were seeing our, store, our prequel to, to Great Expectations on Dickensian and uh, students were going and saying, what, what happens next? And they said, well, actually, there's a book. You should read it. It's called Great Expectations. So I think it did what, uh, I think what, it did what the BBC should be doing, which is um, it's doing the shows that, um, that inform, entertain, educate, and, do all, and f- fulfill their brief. And I think Dickensian did all that. So, yeah, I'm really proud of that. Now, on the day that America votes for their next president, in your opinion, does politics ever have a contributing factor in determining our television fads and fashions? Oh, politics is a um, politics is part of the fabric of everyday life. So I think that um, it should it shouldn't determine what people are watching and what they're not. Um, politicians certainly shouldn't be um, crawling all over the BBC in the, in the way that they are. The BBC belongs to the people, not to not to any particular government. And I think they should just leave it the hell alone and let it do what it does best. I think it should have a brief, which it does. It should be given a charter, which it has. Um, and I think it should fulfill that uh, by making shows like the Kenzie. <laughs> and, um, but I think that the politi- because politics is part of the fabric of life, I think that uh, the best television, certainly the best drama, reflects real life. And uh, and you should recognise characters as well, and and characters' biases sometimes, and their character traits are based upon their political beliefs, uh, in the same way as they, they could be based on their religious beliefs. So, in other words, if you've got um, if you're telling a drama about um, a particular social class, and you know in your heart that they would be labour supporters, you shouldn't shy away from that. You should you know you should embrace that, and you shouldn't even worry about about balance, about making sure you've got give equal weight to conservative characters. It's not about that. You delve into character and you delve into that character's story. Um, so I think that so politics within drama is valid and I think it's something that, that we shouldn't shy away from. Um, uh, either directly through things like House of Cards or Very British Coup and shows like that um, or indirectly just as, uh, as, um, as, as part of the makeup of a character. Um, I just don't think that politics uh, should meddle with what television looks like or what's shown or not shown on television. I'm looking back at your career. What remains your proudest achievement? Um, well, it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's, in different, um, it's in different forms, really. I think that um, I'm really proud of the work that we do for new writers through the Red Planet Prize that we do every year, we try and encourage new writing where we can. Um, I'm really proud of that as, as one element. I'm really proud of Red Planet Pictures and the fact that you know we've got 20, 25 people here all trying to make great TV. We're like a family. I'm really proud of the way that, that, that that's gone. And as a writer, I'm proud of everything I've done, really. I've talked about Dickensian. I think if you have to pick one thing out, I think I'm probably, as a writer, I'm proudest of, of Dickensian because I think that um, that was uh, as kind of the show that was always in me and I just had to kind of had to bring it out. Um, so you, it's, you have to compartmentalise things. It, it's very difficult to say, this is the one thing in my entire 59 years on the planet that I'm most proud of because uh, that have to be my kids. So <laughs> you kind of have to comp- compartmentalise it. So, uh, but as a writer, yeah, the kids do. And finally, what's next for Tony Jordan? Well, go on. Um, lots of things. Um, I'm still, I'm still in a place where, ridiculously, maybe I still want to set the world on fire. 
I still want to do something that makes everybody go, what he's doing work. I like that about about uh, about the projects that I do. So um, so yeah, so we're trying to do that. I'm looking at sci-fi. We're doing a, a, a musical for BBC One called Stop in the Name of Love, which is a dr- full-on drama, but using the music of Motown. Um, about five women in London, modern contemporary London, looking for love. Um, we're doing that. I've had some meetings today about um, about doing some some uh, kind of really strange. Um, I'm trying not to tell you what the idea is because it's that new and I haven't actually told anybody yet. But using special effects in a completely different way and teaming up with with a company that does special effects to create a new ways of telling stories. So look, I'm just really excited. I get excited by by ideas, either mine or other people's, that are trying to either have the creative integrity that I've talked about before, that are real, that are about something, and that mean something, and that are not um, are not cynical in any way, or that are truly groundbreaking, or that that are trying to just push the push the boundaries a little bit, and just try and do something different. Um, and I kind of like that, you know. So I like the idea that we've we, uh, so at Red Planet we don't do just a normal Dickens adaptation. We don't just do Oliver again. What we do is we take all the Dickens novels and we mash it up and we do it all in one place. That makes it Red Planet, that makes it me. Um, we're doing, um, you know, we did Moving More Paper in Echo Beach. So as a writer, it's not about just doing a soap opera. It's not just about doing a sitcom. We did a, a, a sitcom behind the scenes of a soap opera, and then as a separate show, we actually did the soap opera. <laughs> and that, to me, again, is we're just pushing the boundaries as, as much as we can. And that, that's what I love, that's what I still get excited about, and that's what's next for me, because I always want to keep doing that. And the way to, you know, the, everyone knows, the way to sell a show to Red Planet is to come into this room with that kind of passion, with that integrity, or with that gr- aspiration to set the world on fire and pitch. The, if, you've got, if you can only write one more show before you die, come and pitch me that, because that's the show I want. And the way not to sell a show to Red Planet is to come in here and, and say, I found a gap in the market, I think this could make a few quid, or I think we could sell this all around the world. It's a new kind of cop. It's like I'm not interested in doing that. I'm interested in in um, in doing something that's. Uh, it may not be. Look, it doesn't even have to be the most successful thing in the world, because it's just got to be good and it's got to be. You got to you got to be passionate about it, because um, then you've got half a chance. But if you if you are cynical and your ideas or your your uh, what you do for a living is a bit on cynicism, then I think eventually you're bound to fail. So. That's what's next for me, just kind of more of the same, I guess. Thank you very much to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you like this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy? Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates on forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time for another Beyond the Title interview.